neck injury, neck surgery, and neck pain. How is the swallow affected? For neck injuries, neck surgeries, and neck pain, discomfort and reduced mobility aren't the only symptoms patients might experience. Swallowing can be temporarily or even permanently affected in some scenarios. SLPs should have a role in their care when swallowing is impacted. However, sometimes that's not the case. Whether it's because the medical team relies more on the wait and see method as swelling goes down or dysphagia is just an overlooked symptom, these cases are just as important as our neuro and respiratory cases that cause dysphagia. And like with all areas of our field, we really need to use our critical thinking skills and understanding of anatomy and physiology to figure these cases out. Today, we're going to be talking all about neck injuries and surgeries the impact these things might have on swallowing, and how we can assess and treat these kinds of patients. Before I begin our discussion, I want to first give you an advanced warning that we are going to be discussing gunshot wounds and stabbing wounds in this video as we look at penetrating injuries to the neck and the roles of an SLP. In order to promote safe spaces and learning environments, I wanted to give you a heads up in case this video might not serve you. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. Direct trauma or penetrating injury to the neck, such as a gunshot wound, stabbing, falls with cervical spine fracture, spinal cord injury, and motor vehicle accidents are all risk factors for dysphagia. If you notice any of these events in your chart review, consider these questions during your clinical swallow exam. What exact structures were injured? Check imaging and talk with the doctors. Be mindful of any positioning precautions. Take note of all muscles, bones, and any nerves that were affected and think about how those affected structures play a role in swallowing. This helps you determine a hypothesis around how your patient's swallow may be impaired. For example, a gunshot wound with a C2 spinal cord involvement and shattering of the mandible with difficulty with mastication, difficulty with respiration, and clearing secretions. With spinal cord injury, consider what motor and sensory function is intact or not based on a level of injury and ASIA scores, which is the American Spinal Injury Association Impairment Scale. Is there potential for edema at the injury site, especially in acute injury? How will this play a role in swallow function? This can occur with acute C-spine fra fractures in particular. Is there a possibility of extravasation based on the injury? Extravasation is the leakage of material like blood or other fluid from a vessel or tube into the surrounding soft tissue. From a neck injury and swallowing standpoint, this could mean a contrast, food, or liquid that leaks into surrounding soft tissues due to the penetrating injury which can lead to life-threatening infections. Vascular injuries can also lead to leakage of blood into the surrounding tissues, which needs to be managed before we attempt assessing and treating swallowing. Not only do we need to know the patient swallow is safe with sufficient airway protection for PO, and that it is efficient enough to meet nutrition and hydration needs, since a long-term goal is to wean from G-tube feedings and return to oral feedings. But we also need to know about the integrity of the pharynx, larynx, and esophagus to know that PO that is consumed will not leak to surrounding structures and cause infection, which can have a high mortality risk. Some literature has estimated that arterial injury occurs in nearly 25% of penetrating neck injuries, while carotid artery involvement is seen in around 80% of these cases. That's Nowicki et al. 2018. This is important to understand because these carry hemorrhagic and neurological concerns. As always, after your clinical swallow exam, you need to consider if an instrumental is indicated. And in high-risk patients like these, it probably is. One member of the MedSLP Collective shared a tricky case she had involving a patient with a gunshot wound to the anterior neck. The CAT scan of the spine showed multiple fractures throughout the cervical, verte throughout the cervical vertebrae and cricoid cartilage. He had a peg tube and trach placed and couldn't voice with occlusion or with a passing mirror valve. The trauma and neuro teams decided against surgery and they put him in a halo vest, which put his neck in a hyperflexed position. 
The medical team refused a video fluoroscopy at first because they felt like aspiration was already confirmed when they suctioned out material from his tracheostomy and his chest x-ray showed opacity in the right lung base. This SLP fought for a video fluoroscopy and eventually received orders to do one, and she wound up discovering a tracheoesophageal fistula. It proved that even if we can see food and liquid coming out of a tracheostomy tube, we still don't have the full picture. Especially with penetrating neck wounds or anything that alters the anatomy, we need our x-ray vision to see what is the actual root cause of the issue. So far, we've covered traumatic neck injuries and neck surgeries, but there's one more population that we need to cover, and it's a bit of a doozy. Stick with me and don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss out on any of my future videos. Please feel free to share this video with any fellow SLPs that you think would enjoy it. Neck surgeries such as ACDF, carotid endarterectomy, or from head and neck cancer. These patients can be approached in a similar way to blunt neck trauma injury patients. During your clinical swallow exam, ask yourself, what structures were affected during the surgery? Was the surgery elective or was there a trauma? Elective surgeries tend to be smoother sailing than traumas. Were there complications during or post-op that might have caused cranial nerve damage? Could there be intubation injury? Could there be post-op edema? Head and neck cancer, surgical resections, ACDF, and even carotid endarterectomies are all neck surgeries that can result in dysphagia. So correlate your chart review and hypothesis prior to seeing the patient with your cranial nerve exam. Follow up with video fluoroscopy and fees when appropriate. I had a discussion with a colleague of mine who used to work with a lot of patients post-op after they had an ACDF. She told me about the countless patients she saw who had moderate to severe prevertebral tissue swelling that impacted the patient's ability to safely swallow. And I couldn't believe how many patients I saw with that exact same presentation doing fees. One patient in particular had such severe swelling that even the airway became narrow. She and the radiologist saw this under fluoroscopy and chose not to move forward with the barium trials given how severe the swelling was. While neurosurgery wanted to keep the patient on an oral diet, my colleague, the nurses, and even the radiologist disagreed. Nurses began reporting choking episodes and frequent coughing with liquids. Ultimately, my colleague and the patient agreed to short-term alternative means of nutrition while the swelling reduced. This can be particularly challenging for SLPs who work in this setting because of the added pressure to discharge the patient shortly after surgery. Dysphagia secondary to prevertebral tissue swelling can sometimes be the one thing preventing that patient from discharging, and it's important to advocate for our patients as much as we can. I personally used to get a lot of these patients that were discharged from the hospital, but would end up back in a rehab facility a month or two later with major swallowing impairments. I've seen many of these same presentations where the posterior pharyngeal wall is so edematous that it can impede the airway. We as SLPs need to advocate to our surgery teams about these possible complications so that the proper referrals can be put in place ahead of time. Conditions affecting the mucosa, such as inhalation injuries, mucositis, and even caustic ingestion. Patients with injuries to the oropharyngeal mucosa require us to use all the tools in our critical thinking toolbox. Some examples of conditions affecting the mucosa include mucositis, inhalation injuries, and burns. Mucositis is the inflammation of the oral mucosa that can lead to painful mouth sores and is a common side effect of chemo and radiation therapy. Symptoms can include dry mouth, mild burning in the mouth, pain when eating food, soreness or pain in the mouth or throat, blood in the mouth, and oral mucosa that is red, shiny, or swollen. Oral mucositis significantly complicates cancer treatment by contributing to pain, dysphagia, weight loss, depression, higher risk of infection, decreased quality of life, and increased healthcare costs, according to Silverman 2007. Because the pain can often worsen with swallowing, causing odynophagia, patients might eat less and not meet their nutritional needs. Patients will often receive topical anesthetics or narcotics to help manage the pain. If the patient reports pain to you, the next step would be to notify the nurse or physician who will be able to better treat these symptoms. Inhalation injuries and burns. Inhalation injury is the exposure of the respiratory system from the larynx to lungs of intense thermal damage or high concentration of chemicals commonly seen in burn patients. 
the larynx is in fact exposed to the most intense thermal damage, which can lead to vocal fold edema, incomplete vocal fold adduction, reduced airway protection, and dysphonia or aphonia. Symptoms can range from very minor to severe. Clayton et al. in 2020 stated, the incidence of dysphagia in patients with inhalation injury is extremely high, 16 times greater than in those with burn injury. Laryngeal pathology due to inhalation injury increases not only dysphagia severity, but also the duration to dysphagia recovery. Although literature varies and each case is different, some organizations suggest that all patients with facial burns, inhalation injury, a tracheostomy, or if intubated or greater than 48 hours, should receive a swallow evaluation. That's Clayton and Patterson, 2006. On top of typical diet modifications, SLPs might also consider the acidity and temperature of foods and liquids to promote increased comfort and safety during oral intake. Since inhalation injury can impact laryngeal sensation, an instrumental exam is crucial for this patient population. Again, with these cases, consider all the questions from above, like how are the oral pharyngeal structures affected? Could there be edema, nerve damage? Does what I'm seeing on my clinical swallow exam align with the injury? One friend and colleague of mine used to work in the burn unit at her hospital. She would often see inhalation injury, usually from being inside a burning car or building, or what she found to be the most common incident, elderly patients on oxygen forgetting they had their nasal cannula in with the oxygen on when they went to light a cigarette. She would always complete an instrumental swallow study in these cases because of the higher incidence of silent aspiration from inhalation injury, and she was usually right. Part of her therapy plan for this particular occurrence among the elderly population was intensive patient caregiver training for memory strategies and new routines to help prevent this burn injury from ever happening again. Check out the MedSLPCollective.com. Curious to learn more about burns, inhalation injury, and dysphagia? Make sure to check out episodes 218 and 219 of the Swallow Your Pride podcast as Morgan Billinger and Lori Skinner discuss the creation of a burn protocol for their burn facility that changed the game for many of these patients. Need more support with these kinds of challenging cases? Check out metaslpcollective.com to download our free resources or to join our community if you feel like it's a right fit for you.